Hi, everyone. I'm Diane Brady. I'm here with my colleague, Hank Tucker, staff writer on the Monday and investing team. Hank, welcome. Thanks, Diane. Good week. Cover story on Melody Hobson. We're talking about, uh, I suppose, the man behind, beside, the front of the woman, John Rogers and Ariel Investments, because you did a sidebar on him. Talk first about um, Ariel Investments and what it is, for those who don't know. Yeah, John Rogers founded it in, in 1983. He was just 24 years old. Uh, it's an asset manager. It has about $16 billion under management, mostly in mutual funds and, and separately managed accounts. Uh, uh, kind of modeled after Warren Buffett style, a value investing firm tries to buy. Buy and hold. Cheap buy and hold. Uh, their mascots are tortoise. You go into their office, they have all sorts of little figurines of tortoises and sculptures. And, I didn't know that. That's and, interesting. And it's really interesting. And, and you know, even shell imprints, all, you know, metal, wood, it's everywhere. And they take pride in being like the patient investor, active patients is one of their uh, kind of slogans. And, you know, over 40 years, they've really uh, had a track record of outperforming, especially coming out of uh, bear markets when stocks are cheap and, and there's kind of maximum pessimism, which is when they're kind of contrarian, they buy the most. And, you know, John Rogers has, has really been the the chief investment officer, the, the head stock picker the whole way. Of the, and know, he still years. is, right? And I mean, one of the things that, um, so they are the largest black owned um, investment Fund company, the, the, or what's the right way to... Oldest black-owned investment company. There's private equity companies like Vista that has Robert Smith. Okay, uh, that, right. That has more assets, but... Is that the prism through which they've invested as well? Because I know that you wrote this week about this private equity fund that is, in fact, you know, oriented to trying to empower, you know, um, black and, and Latinx owners. But throughout the history of Ariel, has that actually been part of how... He invests. Yeah, not necessarily. They they invest in all sorts of you know high quality, small and mid sized businesses. They feel like are undercovered, overlooked, and they have an edge uh, with their analysts and and with you know John's just you know he feels like I guess an innate you know ability to see long term, see around the corner uh, as a stock picker. They do stress uh, one of the things that both John Rogers and Melody Hobson are. are uh, very passionate about is diversifying corporate boards, and that's something they stress with their. Well, por- she's the chair of the Starbucks well. board. She's the chair of Starbucks. She's also on the J.P. Morgan board. She used to chair the DreamWorks board. Uh, John Rogers is on the Nike board, New York Times, McDonald's. Um, so that, but they do a lot of that themselves, and then they also try to push the management teams at the companies they invest in to you know add underrepresented minorities to their boards. And uh, they say they've done that in about fifty cases, uh, added some diversity to the boardrooms uh, because they feel like a more broad uh, range of perspectives and backgrounds around the table is, you know, contributes to better business success. Um, but it's not, uh, you know, the top, you know, a prerequisite for investing right. in companies. You know, one of the things that before we get on to John Rogers uh, stock picks in this climate is he really is a role model for the power of mentorship because he spotted Melody Hobson Young and has been such a champion for her career. And she is clearly the most famous black woman on Wall Street from where I sit. Tell, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, he was uh, he a Princeton alum, uh, Princeton former basketball captain uh, there, where uh, he played with a lot of interesting people, including Craig Robinson, Michelle Obama's brother, that started a relationship with him. In terms of Melody Hobson, he was in charge of uh, recruiting prospective high school students uh, in the Chicago area, where Ariel's based, where he's mm-hmm. from, and where Melody Hobson's from, and uh, met her at you know these events. Uh, invited her to a dinner at the Chicago Yacht Club uh, where she was surrounded by other alums and and who she was set on going to Harvard. Uh, she got in, accepted to Harvard and Princeton, a very impressive, mm-hmm. obviously, high school student. And uh, other people at this table, she tells the story about how Richard Missner, a venture capitalist at this table, uh, overheard her saying that she planned to go to Harvard and uh, made everybody stop right away and immediately sat next to her and move around and told her he would change her life. And and he did, and through that she met Bill Bradley, another former Princeton basketball player at the time, a U.S. senator, yeah, uh, who helped recruit her to Princeton. But John Rogers was really kind of at the the origin of that those connections that she's always able to make, and just have this energy level that makes people want to be around her. And and she's, she's still there. And Incredibly. she's still there. She stayed in touch with Roger. She interned at Ariel after her sophomore year at Princeton. Uh, after uh, she interned at T. Rowe Price the next summer, which she helped set up actually. And then after she graduated, she had opportunities to, you know, she interviewed, at, you know, all sorts of big New York, you know, Wall Street banks. And Ariel was still really tiny at that point. 
um, just a few years after John Rogers started it. And she talked about wanting to be really in the room from day one where decisions were made. Yeah. And and John Rogers let her do that and encouraged her to speak up and said, you know, you know your ideas are just as good as all these other people who seem. It's incredible. Know, I mean, it's just it's it's such a it's such a long standing relationship. And I think a poignant tale people don't actually recognize. I want to get to you call John Rogers the comeback king. Um, why? Well, you know, Ariel, it's had obviously, you know, ups and downs as any investment firm has had over, that's had a 40 year track record. Uh, it, its best years have come, you know, out of the broader market's lowest points and some of the, the own firm's lowest points. Uh, in 2008, obviously, you know, it was a, a bad year for most investors. Ariel was no exception. It fell, you know, its main Ariel fund, the flagship fund, fell 48% that year. Uh, investors fled, withdrew their money. It was really almost an existential crisis for the firm that you know mm-hmm. they were wondering if they'd survive. Their assets went down from 21 billion at its peak in the middle of that decade down to three billion at the low point, and uh, they kind of uh, just stayed stuck to their guns. And and you know a lot of those stocks that had performed so poorly that year, they added more to their those positions. They added new positions, and they came back with a 63 percent gain in 2009. Uh, which uh, was, you know, outperformed most of their peers, the rest of the market. Uh, same as in the the dot com bubble, you know, they kind of underperformed the most of the stock market in the late nineteen nineties when there was just this growth bubble, valuations right. were exploding, tech stocks. We're stock. all buying pets. dot com, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and they've never really been, you know, following the crowd in that way. And then, you know, that popped, and and the S and P five hundred crashed in you know two thousand one, two thousand two. In both those years, Ariel was still up, you know, double digits, uh, and, and 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 it's it's out. It's gone from underperforming again. This pattern um, during sort of the downturn we saw late last year to now at least on track to be outperforming this year. Wh- where are they placing their bets right now? Yeah, uh, their largest holdings, Madison Square Garden Entertainment, uh, and they also have a couple other media bets, including a Paramount Global. Um, both of those stocks didn't perform well at all last year. I mean, media, you know, we all know about the disruption, streaming wars, you know, so much competition, yeah. uh, cord cutting, you know, there's all these scary words out there. And, you know, Rogers, uh, you know, just the main philosophy of being greedy when others are fearful, buying at maximum pessimism, really believes that, you know, they can monetize that content. And, and the MSG side, uh, this is a company that spun off from their sports business in 2020. So it, it manages the live entertainment at Madison Square Garden. It also has Radio City Music Hall. Um, John Rogers talks a lot about the MSG Sphere, which is a $2.2 billion venue in Las Vegas that's going to open this year. And he thinks it's going to bring in a lot of revenue. And, mm-hmm. and as people, you know, especially out of COVID, we're all starting to kind of. Hey, New go, York's in a casino race right now. So go enjoy, you know, a little, a little more luxury and, and live events and experiences. And uh, it, it performed, you know, extremely well in January. Uh, you know, I don't think Rogers would ever take a one month performance as, as something that's indicative of, of uh, you know, a long term trend or track record. Past but, performance does not necessarily, <laughs> you know, dictate future gains. But I'm sure it's certainly something he's happy with. Um, you know, MSG, I think there's been some controversy with it, with, uh, you know, the facial recognition they're using to, you know, ban uh, lawyers that work at the firms uh, that are involved in litigation proceedings against the company oh. from entering the Jim, Jim Dolan, uh, who obviously is a Nick's uh, controversial owner in a lot of ways, uh, you know, has made some enemies. But, you know, it, obviously he's built these uh, great you know venues and great networks. Uh, Roger cited the uh, regional sports network that falls under that, that broadcasts the New York Knicks and New York Rangers games. Uh, you know, he's a definitely a basketball fan and thinks the Knicks are going to win again someday. Let me ask a question. Because they're on such prominent boards, and I know, of course, Melody Hobson is married to George Lucas, and, um, you know, do they have to, do they stay away from the companies in which they have some sort of fiduciary duty as a director, or do we know? I mean, they're not on the boards of the companies that 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 are in their portfolio. Uh, I think they do think their board experience is kind of, uh, you know, are very you know educational and sure, informative, of course, and, and of help course. make connections and and. But and they wouldn't have ideas. Starbucks as a core holding in a fund in which she's chair of the Stars Starbucks board, right? No. I'm just trying to... And Ariel and you know they their core is small companies, small and mid cap companies, and and they've 
reached a stature, I guess, where they're on the boards of these large companies. But right. there, there's not much overlap between that and, and their funds. Any other views in terms of his view of the landscape right now for investing? You mentioned some of the major holdings in the media space and obviously MGM being a core holding. Any other areas that he's looking at as being interesting just for those who like to co-invest with people like him? Yeah, he likes uh, financial services companies a lot. He's uh, been invested in Lazard, an investment bank, for about 15 years. Uh, definitely likes private equity. They're obviously starting a private equity fund, which we wrote about yep. themselves uh, with Project Black. They're also invested in private equity firms like the Carlyle Group. Uh, they had KKR, this uh, another giant alternative asset manager, in their portfolios for a while that performed very well. And they recently sold out of that just because it got too big. And they, they generally don't like to have these larger cap companies uh, that uh, they think the market is kind of caught up to, been more efficient right. and are covered in that. Let me ask about Project Black quickly. I know that you wrote about it. And please, I hope everybody sees the article and such. But um, that is the first time that, that there's been a very direct and um, concerted effort to address the income gap, the wealth gap with black Americans and you know, sort of overall society. Talk a little bit about the genesis of that, and, and it's a major fund and a major holding, clearly, for Ariel. Yeah, it's a $1.45 billion private equity fund, a lot larger than most first-time funds that a firm would raise. Uh, it really sprung out of all the the reckoning in 2020 that happened you know, after George the murder Floyd. of George Floyd. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Melody Hobson, obviously is connected to so many people, titans of Wall Street, and including Jamie Dimon. She's on the J.P. Morgan board. Yep. And, you know, he called her to, to just kind of brainstorm for ideas about, uh, you know, what, you know, he wanted J.P. Morgan to partner with some firms like Ariel or, or just get her, you know, pick her brain about what to do about, you know, investing more in, in you know, elevating black entrepreneurs, black mm -hmm. businesses. And, and she kind of took that on and, and wrote this memo to, to him, and he was sold about uh, not just you know, access to capital for black business owners, but access to customers. And so uh, that's something we wrote a lot about, and, and they talk a lot about in, in this launch of this fund. And you know, they're investing in uh, middle market businesses uh, with revenues between $100 million and $1 billion uh, that can then uh, sell, be vendors, uh, as, really business to business uh, yeah. vendors for large you know, S&P 500 companies, the, the biggest companies in the world. The first uh, investment they made is Sorensen, a, a company that uh, makes products, you know, hearing aids for the deaf and hard of hearing and, mm -hmm. and has already started partnerships with some large companies for their employees. Um, and, and their goal, I mean, it's interesting because um, really the private equity model is to have operating companies, and that's where their board experience really, I'm sure, be, is very valuable. And it really is also about nurturing this new generation of management talent too, isn't it? Yeah. And something they do is, you know, when they buy a company, sometimes it's not already run by a black or Latino uh, CEO or owner. Uh, they'll install new management teams. They talk about, you know, when... Whenever you know an executive says, "Well, you know, we try to hire you know underrepresented." It's a pipeline, but, yeah. But we, we can't find the talent, you know, and and but you know they're in that world every day. They uh, with the the CEO who uh, Melody Hobson asked to to run Aerial Alternatives Project Black, Les Brun, who has been uh, uh, in private equity for a long time at Hamilton Land Advisors. Yeah, uh, he knows a lot of those you know people too that are that are in the pipeline that they think uh, are great choices to run these businesses. Um, and so that's something that, that they think they have kind of a, a distinct kind of advantage uh, compared to people that just shrug their shoulders yeah. and, and think there's nothing they can very do. Very powerful. Um, and John Rogers is not a man who seeks the spotlight, but certainly somebody very respected on Wall Street. So I guess watch this space. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Diane.